Well, Michael, I'm the Assistant Director of Community Development and Planning uh, here at the City of Cedar Rapids. Our staff members provide staff support to the Visual Arts Commission. Uh, that's how we have a uh, connection to the event this evening. And uh, Bill Staymates, our chairperson, uh, is, is in the audience today. You may have seen him as you were uh, walking in the door, and, and he uh, may have greeted you. And if you're not familiar, the Visual Arts Commission does a lot of great work uh, in the community. Uh, with the curation and, and maintenance of the city's art collection, as well as uh, organizing a number of other events uh, surrounding visual arts and, and promoting uh, visual arts and, and their value in the community. So uh, thanks to them <coughs> for, for helping us with this. And uh, this is the second in a series of four lecture series on the, uh, the murals here in City Hall. And uh, we're gonna focus tonight on the South Wall, uh, the uh, the first, uh, Christy Rain, uh, who's a member of our Visual Arts Commission, as well as the uh, director of the library, University Library at uh, Mount Mercy University, uh, gave a, uh, a fantastic presentation at the first uh, event in, uh, in November. So uh, that was focused on the, uh, the North Wall. So we've got two really excellent speakers this evening. I'm, I'm excited to introduce and uh, the way that uh, the schedule will work this evening, uh, our first presenter I will introduce, and he's joining us over the phone. And uh, after his presentation, he's in California. Uh, after his presentation, uh, Seth will walk around with this uh, microphone I have in my hand. If you have questions, we'll do a, a bit of a question and answer session. And uh, then we'll, I'll introduce our second speaker this evening uh, so that Scott can uh, uh, get on with uh, his evening in, in California. Uh, so our, our first speaker is Scott Haskins. Uh, Mr. Haskins is an author, consultant, and has practiced as a professional art conservator since 1975. Mr. Mr. Haskins describes art conservation as, uh, quote, the perfect marriage of his two main interests, the application of science to the preservation and restoration of art. Mr. Haskins has completed restoration and consulting work in the US and Europe for a long list of notable clients, including the US government, the family of Pope John Paul III, the Shroud of Turin Project, and the Getty Conservation Institute. Mr. Haskins is an expert in disaster preparation, providing clients with the tools necessary to ensure the safety of valuable art, financial records, and historically significant documents. As I mentioned, uh, Mr. Haskins is joining us on the phone, and we'll be advancing uh, his slides here in the room, and we'll uh, again take questions after his presentation. So uh, thanks again, everyone, for being here. And with that, uh, Scott, hopefully you can hear me. Uh, I'm going to hand it off to you. I can hear you just fine. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. It's good. Uh, just make sure to speak directly into your mic, but otherwise I think you're good. Yep. Okay, good. Well, thank you very much for that wonderful introduction. Uh, that was the second best introduction I've ever had. Uh, a little while ago, I had to introduce myself and uh, embellished, it, embellished it a bit. So anyway, great job. Thank you. Uh, it's interesting that I've written a book, I've written a series of books on uh, how to take care of your artwork and how to take care of your collectibles and heirlooms. And in fact, at the end of my talk today, I'm going to give you a link that you can go to and get a copy of uh, my latest multimedia book, which has, uh, which is only available through a download, but is, uh, but has 35 how-to videos embedded into it. And I'm going to uh, give that link to all of you to be able to download uh, the book for free. Can you still hear me? Okay. Yep. Yes. yes. So uh, I've, I've got. Uh, a call coming on my phone that I'm ignoring. <laughs> anyway, uh, it's interesting. Uh, I, I, uh, I live in Santa Barbara, California. Does that uh, ring uh, familiar with anybody these days? <laughs> We've been under siege with horrible uh, wildfires for the last 10 days, and uh, we're still circulating. To, uh, anytime you go outside, you have to put a mask on to uh, protect your, your breathing. So it's, uh, it's been, uh, it's been something that, uh, that I'll have to, uh, hopefully has to change, uh, chase some ambulances for and get some work coming up here pretty quick, clean all the ash off of artwork. Uh, I, uh, uh, will always consider 
uh, the work that we did at your city hall uh, on your murals as one of the highlights of my career. The murals, uh, the, the process of rediscovering the murals from under six layers of paint uh, that had been used to repaint the room and repaint it and repaint it and repaint it, uh, was the rediscovery process was exhilarating. It's very interesting to uh, be peeling off that top, those top layers of paint and then see those original historic uh, uh, murals and paintings uh, come merging out from behind. It was really uh, a fun experience. And we've done it lots of other times also. But the history, uh, the value of the historical value of these murals for your community and the quality of the murals and uh, the story behind them, uh, it was, was great. It was great. And so it was a wonderful, wonderful thing to be part of. We also loved working with uh, everyone in City Hall, all of the people that we got to work with uh, were competent and were gracious and were uh, hospitable and uh, collaborated and cooperated and made the uh, working experience uh, very nice. Uh, they were all very professional and the project went very smoothly, not one hiccup along the way. And uh, so that's a credit to... Uh, to the quality of people there in City Hall and uh, how and how it's run, I guess. Uh, there is a page on our blog that uh, reviews the entire uh, project. And uh, Seth, did you uh, hand out a flyer for this meeting? Yep. Um, yep. Yeah. There's uh, for anyone who didn't get one. There's a flyer in up front it has uh, links at the bottom of it to um, some videos that Scott has put online um, I went ahead and shortened the URLs on those so they're easier to put in but yeah great so there uh, the um, so those uh, there's a, there's a page that tells a lot of the details there's lots of videos there to look at that uh, you may find interesting but we thought we would uh, would uh, instead of listening to me talk uh, that you might enjoy seeing the uh, the video that basically summarizes all the work and yet shows you a bit of the processes. So, Seth, if you want to go ahead and run that video, go right ahead. Right. Oh. Hold on a second. I need to bump up the volume. Okay, here we go. Where's our volume? My name is Scott Haskins. I'm with Fine Art Conservation Laboratories. The Heritage Preservation Project of restoring the old federal courthouse for the new city hall of Cedar Rapids, Iowa, included the contract to remove the overpaint from the WPA murals of 1937 that are located in the city council chambers. Not only was there some nervousness about their restoration, but they were painted out originally because there was objectionable controversial subject matter. Once the decision was made to go forward, there was great excitement about the discovery process. To begin, small tests are made to determine how many layers of paint are on top of the murals. The results of those tests help us to make bigger tests to determine if the paint is soluble or stable during the cleaning process. Once we see that the procedure is safe for the mural, then we proceed with larger areas. This time-lapse cleaning is kind of fun to watch. We've reduced hours of work down to a few seconds. 
Here we're going down through the individual layers of paint until we arrive at the last layer just before we get to the original mural. We're particularly careful that removing this last layer does not affect the original paint in any way. The discovery process of seeing images and murals resurface after being hidden for 50 years is very exciting. The final layer to be removed was a gray haze that left everything looking kind of muddy and the colors looking rather muted. Different layers required different cleaning techniques. Removing this difficult hazy layer allowed us to regain the original brilliance of the murals. You can see that this area has been uh, abraded and there's lots of little dots missing. Of course, we're going to take care of that during in painting. But you can see the damage that's occurred. And uh, one of the ways that I monitor how well we're doing on the project and how thorough we've been is uh, when I do the first layer of varnish before we in paint, uh, I work it into the surface of the mural to make sure that we get a f fully saturated layer. So, so I want to show you how that's done. It goes, I scrub it, and I, kind of, I really don't scrub it, I just kind of work it into the surface as you can see, and I go over all the areas. And if the paint is unstable, if the paint is unstable or we haven't got it exactly clean, or something's amiss, then this is a time when I can see that. And I wanted you to see that on the um, sponge, I guess, that I'm using for the varnishing, that uh, there is no dirt, uh, there are no particles of paint that are flaking, and uh, I've got no color as far as being dissolved. So we've been very thorough, 100% uh, effective in this process of uh, taking off the overpaint stabilizing the paint layer, not attacking the original paint, and now consolidating the paint layer, saturating it, getting it ready for in paint. The work is going fantastic. The murals technique of oil paint on canvas glued to the wall means that over time pockets can occur between the canvas and the wall. These detachments are injected with a conservation grade adhesive and reattached to stabilize them. The professional term for the technique of retouching is called in-painting. Damage inflicted during the 1960s requires a very respectful and controlled dot-to-dot dot process with a very small brush. When a painting has been overcleaned or skinned, it loses the color on the tops of the nubs of the canvas, and the painting looks like it's out of focus. By connecting all the dots with new color, the images are more complete and the colors are more intense. This GQ image of a fireman needed just such help and you can see here that by dotting in the scuff marks he comes into focus. So we've just discovered something exciting and that is uh, during the in painting when we're going over every square inch of the painting uh, we were following the historical photographs during the in painting to make sure that we got details right and looking for clues to damaged areas that may have happened back in the 60s. And uh, we were unaware that this mural uh, was signed because uh, we couldn't see a signature anywhere. And uh, so we were looking over this photograph here and underneath the hand of the policeman right here, on the photograph, there's the, f there's the signature and the date by the artist. And it's supposed to be right here.
So that is an exciting detail, I think, that we should include and we will put back on the mural according to the historical photograph. Before the removal of the overpaint from the murals in the city council chambers, it was known that this scene of the hanging was the most controversial scene on the murals back in its day. The story is told that the murals were painted out to obliterate this scene. Unexpectedly, however, we found that when the paint was removed, this area was very badly damaged. The details around these figures were removed on purpose. Historical photographs from 1937 showed that newspapers carried the headlines that syphilis had been defeated and that we should play ball. These details were removed with a stripper before the area was painted out. The murals now re-revealed 50 years later, we completed the lost images with respectful recreations according to the original photographs. The process of inpainting requires a technical skill of color matching. Creativity is not one of the required talents. The final treatment is to apply several layers of spray applied solvent based acrylic varnish. I have often felt that our art conservation work has a social conscience aspect to it. We are honored to have been called to undertake the restoration of these historic murals. An important part of the heritage of this city and its people has been preserved. These murals are not just a decoration in the city council chambers. They are a time capsule that allows the viewer to look into the past. It's a legacy that everyone can be proud of. All right. So there you go. So uh, that uh, summarizes well, I think, the uh, process that we went through without getting uh, boorish. We had uh, and invited uh, visitors to come by and ask questions and see the work as it was in progress. And we enjoyed uh, getting lots of different comments. We had lots of people come down uh, specifically because they saw us in the news and they wanted to see it in progress. So that was, uh, it was nice to be able to explain and have people tell us their stories and how they remember, how they remembered the murals with, uh, over time. Um, so it was, uh, it was a wonderful project for us. Uh, we, uh, we remain enthusiastic about your murals and, uh, I've worked on WPA murals, uh, throughout the United States, pretty much through my entire career. And uh, the, uh, of course, your heritage there of uh, WPA modernist or regionalist art is, is great. And uh, the uh, images of, uh, of your part of the country and history and, and, uh, and everything were, were, wonderful, uh, were a wonderful thing to exp to be, for, for us to experience. So that's about all I've got to, uh, to give you a summary of. And... Uh, if you have any questions, I'd be happy to explain things to you or, or, or respond to uh, whatever you'd like me to, to address. All right. Um, so I'm going to walk around with the microphone, and if anyone has any questions, you guys can ask. Um, the, Scott won't be able to hear you unless you're talking directly into the mic. Um, just real quick before we get there, I think uh, I seem to recall Scott when – we were talking when you were here last time, you kind of made the point that you don't consider yourself to be an artist, correct? Absolutely not. Uh, there is, uh, because uh, I, I consider artists uh, that, you know, they have a job that's creative. They, uh, they design things, they create things, they plan things out, and then through their creative process, they have something they produce. 
we there there is nothing creative about our work. Uh, the closest we get to being an artist might be that there's a certain element of craftsmanship involved in what we do because uh, there's a hand-eye coordination, but there's a great amount of judgment too, much like there would be with uh, a medical doctor or a dentist. Uh, there is the uh, there's the hand-eye coordination and layers of judgment you saw while we were taking the overpaint off of the walls. Uh, you know, it was basically like dissecting the walls and uh, and and digging down to the original murals. And uh, so the uh, uh, we don't consider ourselves artists. And in fact, uh, I've never painted a painting. And uh, the people that work with me in the lab are not artists either. We never hire artists. In fact, artists are so wrapped up in their creativity, they usually make really awful restorers. <laughs> All right. Um We'll start off with questions, I guess. If this building ever had to be demolished, could these murals be cut out and preserved? Uh, yes, they could. They, uh, the, as, as I said in the film, they're oil painted on canvas, and then the canvas is glued to the walls. So uh, there have been many circumstances in which we have detached the canvas from the walls of buildings that were being demolished. Uh, we just finished uh, th uh, three... 30-foot paintings for the state of Texas, and I have one more 30-foot painting uh, in the lab right now that, uh, that we're about to work on. And all of these murals were removed from buildings that were being demolished and, um, and were saved. Could you tell me how many man hours went into this project? I cannot. Although uh, we were there three times working, and uh, all three times were about three times about three weeks worth of work, and there were and there were three of us working on the mural. So, I guess that's about as good as I can give it to you, and you can do the math. Why the crazy people that put paint on top of it? Why did they put four layers of paint? Um, actually, it was six layers of paint, I think. And um, I think the first one was uh, maybe the first two were at the demand or at the requirement or at the command of a, a federal judge that was in the building. And then I think basically the room got repainted another few times. Uh, so um, that uh, I think that was it. Do do y'all know why they were painted out? Yeah. I think uh, you know what we've heard mostly was that uh, lynching scene that you mentioned in your video is the yeah. key part of it. Yeah, it's interesting to me why they would have, let's say, one scene on one wall that. Uh, that they didn't like, and maybe, you know, why didn't they just paint out the one wall and leave the other three? Yeah. But uh, WPA art, after a while, of course, was kind of old-fashioned looking, I guess. And uh, they may have, I don't know, thought they were modernizing or upgrading the look of everything. You know, they lowered the ceiling and eliminated the beautiful Beaux-Arts architecture in the ceiling. That's up that's still up above you and uh, in uh, behind behind that drop ceiling. And uh, as they did that work and made things look more streamlined and more modern, I guess they felt that uh, the murals were old fashioned and needed to go. But that's, a, that's a, I guess, a, a supposition that I'm making. Could you please uh, compare or contrast these murals with other WPA mur murals? In what way would you like me to contrast them? Uh, any particular way, size, scope, the subject matter? Well, the Works Project Administration uh, hired artists to paint murals in a lot of post offices. Uh, they were uh, put in libraries. They, uh, you know, I'm sure all of you have seen these WPA murals in different places. I've worked on 
maybe eight or nine small murals in post offices in Pennsylvania and in uh, Georgia. Um, I've worked on, uh, you know, the same period of art uh, and, you know, on a gargantuan level in, uh, in Dallas, Texas and in Los Angeles. Uh, again, I think that the regional design or regional artistic tradition that you have there uh, gives them a look that's particular and, uh, you know, and uh, there's a real interest in them. As you know, you have some artists work from your area that's worth quite a bit and highly esteemed on a national level. And uh, so I think that's, uh, you know, that's a wonderful, uh, it's, it's a wonderful heritage to have these murals. Does that answer your question? Uh, yes, it does. Thank you. So you're saying that some of those other murals, say in Dallas, were much larger than these? Yeah, we uh, worked on about 8,000 square feet of murals in Dallas. And uh, so, you know, that, that turned out to be a two-year project with, uh, with a team of 20 art conservators. So uh, it, was, it, was, it was quite a, quite a, big, a big deal. But uh, the style of them is completely different. It'd be like trying to compare apples and bananas. You might prefer one rather than the other. But, uh, you know, they're, they're, they're both uh, have high quality and have, uh, you know, uh, an important historical and artistic uh, style that's, uh, you know, that, that makes them beautiful in their own location and, their own, and in their own environment. We were just curious, uh, where in Dallas are those? At Fair Park. If you look, if you're looking along the Centennial Building, and uh, 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 the, all of those murals were painted out with the same number of layers of paint, and we revealed all of those. Also, the Sheep and Goat Building along, along behind that, and the and the Food and Fiber Building. Well, we're still hoping, and we've got a proposal for the uh, for the Tower Building. If you know Dallas, if you know Fair Park, uh, there's the Tower Building that still has murals in it, and there's another building just to the left of that behind the, uh, the assembly, uh, the, uh, the uh, what do they call it, the, uh, um, the name of the buildings, you know, not coming to mind. Anyway, there's still murals to be uncovered, maybe even another 15,000 square feet of them. Just curious, you mentioned about these drop-down ceilings. Does that mean there is still some painting that might go up further than what we can see? Uh, no, there's no painting above them, but the uh, but the Beaux Arts design of the ceiling. There's architectural features up there that you can't see that have been covered up. Any other questions for Scott about the restoration of the murals? All right. Well, Scott, thank you very much for your time. We certainly appreciate it. Did we stay on time? Yeah, I think you're good. I think we're right on time. Excellent. Right, so, uh, if y'all have something to write with. I'll give you the URL to download uh, my latest uh, book, uh, and that and go to uh, collection care tips dot com. Collection care tips dot com, and you know those they all you all run those words together, and it'll ask you to put your name in there and your email address. Don't worry, I won't spam you with a bunch of stuff. And then, and then you can download the book. Scott, this is uh, Bill Michael again. I did the math uh, about man hours as I was sitting there, and I, I made some assumptions that you worked diligently for eight hours uh, without a, a lunch break. Yeah. So at uh, three individuals, eight hours a day, a standard five-day work week, uh, for three weeks is 360 hours, although I'm sure you probably uh, put in some overtime. Uh, yeah, we worked on Saturdays, and uh, we, and then, of course, uh, you have the uh, kind of the setup. They call it mobilization, the setup and the takedown of the project and all that kind of stuff. But, so uh, three weeks for, and that, and that was for, uh, you know, for each one of the walls that we worked on. That's fantastic. Well, uh, Scott, I, I would like to thank you for uh, taking the time to join us today and, and provide this information. So uh, thank you very much, and, and we're going to give you a round of applause here. Thank you. Well, 
thank you. I I enjoy I enjoy associating uh, with you folks any chance I get. So uh, give me a call in the future, and we'll do it again. Fantastic. Thank you. Best wishes, everybody. Thanks. So our next speaker this evening is Sean Ulmer. Uh, Mr. Ulmer has served as the executive director of the Cedar Rapids Museum of Art since 2014, after serving as the curator of collections and exhibitions since 2005, and also as the interim executive director. Mr. Ulmer has nearly 30 years of curatorial experience, including over 120 exhibitions and acquisition of numerous works of art. Mr. Ulmer has previously held curatorial positions with the University of Michigan Museum of Art, the Herbert F. Johnson Museum of Art at Cornell University, and at The Ohio State University's Wexner Center for the Arts. Mr. Ulmer received a Bachelor of Arts in Art History from the University of Toledo and a Master of Arts in Art History from The Ohio State University. Thank you very much uh, for being here, uh, Sean, and I'll hand it over to you. Can you all hear me? Yeah. Okay. Just let me know if, if I fade out or if I turn my head and you can't hear me. So thank you all for coming. Um, thank you, Seth and crew, for changing all of the seating um, in city council chambers in this kind of parliamentary uh, setup so that um, you can uh, look at the screens but also look at the south wall, which is what we're going to be talking about. Um, this evening. And I don't know how many of you were here to hear Christy Rainey speak last time. So a few of you. And she went over all of the different artists involved in the project, uh, their connection to uh, Stone City Art Colony, to Grant Wood, uh, and sort of general uh, uh, overview of, of the uh, WPA. Um, and I'm going to pick up kind of where she left off, but focus exclusively on, on the South Wall. Um, the WPA is a term that we kick around a lot when we talk about art uh, of the early 30s, um, but it's actually sort of a misnomer. It was sort of the umbrella name. The Works Progress uh, Administration was an umbrella name. There are many, many, many programs underneath that umbrella. Um, and the first that affected artists was the PWAP, um, which was the Public Works of Art Project. And it ended abruptly. It only ran from December of 33 until June of 34. Um, so it really was only about six months long, but it's the one that a lot of people know, the PWAP. It was replaced by TRAP, uh, the TRAP, the Treasury Relief Art Project that began in July of 35 and ran until June of 39. And the murals that you see here are a uh, product of the TRAP program. Uh, and many artists who had worked for the PWAP, who were suddenly unemployed, again, um, were then sort of uh, applying for, for projects um, under TRAP, and that's what this group um, did. Uh, this was a group of artists who, uh, some of whom had worked with Grant Wood, others had not, um, and Grant Wood was overseeing the WPA um, in, in Iowa at the time, but this group banded together and, and uh, made applications for their own, for their own um, projects. And, uh, and they won this one. Um, the, they were led um, by Ro Francis Robert White, um, who Christy talked about last time. He was Ed Rowan's successor as head of the Little Gallery here in Cedar Rapids. Um, and he was the supervising uh, artist for this particular um, project uh, and, this, and this group. Um, what you have here are four walls. Um, two are 48 feet wide and two are 60 feet wide. So very, very large murals. The north wall. Um, was by uh, Francis Robert White um, that sort of dealt with the conquest, expansion, and development of the West, um, as it was known. The South Wall that we're going to be looking at tonight um, was done by Harry Donald Jones, um, and it focused on inherited culture. The East Wall, which we'll talk about next time, um, was by Everett Jeffrey, um, and it focused on uh, sort of comparisons between lynch law and settled tribunal, as well as superstition versus science. Um, and then the West Wall was largely completed by Howard Johnson, and it focused on community service, firemen, uh, policemen, uh, a cooperative uh, uh, office, uh, work release offices as well. And then Don Glassell um, worked on both the East and West Walls, um, particularly in the roundels, 
um, that you see here and, and the, the, the lunettes above, above the windows. We're going to focus, as I said tonight, on the south wall, um, which was completed by um, Harry Donald Jones. Let's see if this will work here. Okay. Here's a, one of the very, 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 very few pictures of Harry Donald Jones in existence. And unfortunately, it's taken from uh, a, uh, a newspaper. This is from the Des Moines Register in 1938. Um, he was working in Des Moines in the late 30s um, after he completed um, the mural here. And we'll talk about that at the end of my talk. Um, he was actually born in Vincennes, Indiana. Um, he studied at what was then Iowa University um, and then also at the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston as well as at Harvard University. Um, he was based in Iowa until 1941 when he entered the Navy during World War II. Um, after his time in the service, um, he settled in San Francisco, um, where he had a very successful career um, as a photographer. What you can see in front of you, and you can see on the screens right now, is the South Wall. Um, and we call it inherited culture, um, but it was actually called American Archaeological Research um, in the book, the sort of the Uber book, the, uh, the, the book that everyone re, re, uh, re consults, called Art in Federal Buildings. Um, in, uh, it's a two-volume uh, set of books, uh, and it, is, um, it lays out all of the, the federal art projects. Um, it talks about what um, the different subject matter was. Um, so it's kind of the Bible, if you will, um, for art in federal buildings. Um, and they uh, entitled the South Wall uh, as American Archaeological Research. Um, so it's a little bit uh, more specific than inherited culture. Um, the left hand, the far left hand scene, which you see here uh, on the wall, um, was entitled in that book, Modern Mexican Culture. Um, and this is the title that you find in that book, the Art and Federal Buildings book. Um, and what it depicts um, for us um, is an artist at work on a mural, in a mural. Uh, and, it, the, uh, and Jones chose to focus on a well-known artist, um, this is the artist, Jose Clemento, Clemente Orozco, um, who was born in 1883 and died in 1949. Um, or Orozco, along with Diego Rivera and David Alfaro Siqueiros, was one of the triumvirate of, of the, the top three Mexican muralists. Um, just as we talk about regionalism as being Grant Wood, uh, John Stuart Curry, and Thomas Hart Benton, that kind of trio, of, of leaders in the regionalist movement, the trio of Mexican muralists um, were uh, Orozco, Rivera, and Siqueiros. Um, and he, uh, Jones, chooses to represent um, Orozco um, creating uh, a mural. And, and Orozco actually was the most political of the three Mexican muralists. And Mexican muralists were actually active making murals before American muralists were. Um, a mural, uh, mural production in the United States really did not exist to any great extent at all until the 1930s, until the WPA. Um, and so it's not surprising that American muralists would look to professional muralists um, it, it, in their neighbors to the south. Um, and so in this particular case, um, Jones is looking at Orozco, and not just a rose co painting a mural, but a very, very, very specific um, uh, uh, mural. Um, this is actually an image uh, from a rose co's very famous mural called The Epic of American Civilization. It was created uh, for the lower level of the Baker Memorial Library on Dartmouth College um, between the years 1932 and 1934, so just prior to the creation of this mural. Uh, I meant to uh, include this image here. This is actually a photograph of Orozco, um, the, the muralist, and a, an image of him working on the murals at Dartmouth. The Dartmouth uh, sequence of murals was 24 frescoed panels, and it, it explored the impact of both indigenous Native Americans and European colonists on North America, the impact of war, both the Mexican Civil War and World War I, and the impact of industrialization. Those were the themes that Orozco included um, in his mural uh, for Dartmouth. And here is a nice image 
sort of a, a sweeping image of these very, very large uh, murals um, that he did at, at, at Dartmouth uh, and of students studying uh, with the murals around them. Uh, and, and just to the right hand uh, uh, kind of corner of this slide is the image that we see depicted in our mural. This image. This is the Christ figure uh, that he included. It was really the, the summation, um, the, the apex of his mural cycle for Dartmouth. It was uh, called the Modern Migration of Spirit. And it's a depiction of uh, Jesus sweeping away old religious and political ideologies, discarding symbols of religion, culture, and the military. You see him holding an ax, an ax by which he chopped down his own cross. Um, it's, it's very much a, a militant Christ. Uh, it's a Christ that rejects um, sacrificial destiny. Um, and he overcomes uh, militarism, um, which you can see in the background with tanks and armaments. He overcomes religion, um, not just the, the uh, chopping down of his own cross, but you see right behind that is a Buddha figure, statue. Um, there's also a fallen minaret. Um, and he also overcomes the perversion of culture, um, which you see with the broken ionic column in the background and the fragment of a sculpture representing Aphrodite. Uh, and, uh, and so this is a very, very politically charged image. And it's interesting that this is the one image um, that uh, Jones decides to include. You can see he's very, very faithful um, to um, Orozco's uh, mural in that he, uh, and we under, from what I understand, he used a photograph of that mural um, to create this image of Orozco, uh, and it actually does look like him uh, uh, creating a, sort of the foundation um, uh, below um, the true fresco. And you can see to his left, to Orozco's left, is somebody actually uh, applying a wet plaster into which Orozco um, will be painting. The next scene, and as you may know from looking at these images, um, the murals tend to be not one story, but several different episodes all stitched together. Um, and the next scene um, that we see are actually three scenes, the, three, the next three scenes, all underneath one uh, title as provided to us by the Art in Federal Buildings uh, book called Inherited American Culture, and it's from that um, that we get, we kind of abbreviate it and just call it inherited culture. Um, these three scenes represent first to the left, the excavation of a mound tomb, uh, and then in the center, documentation of ancient Mexican ruins, specifically Teotihuacan, um, and to the right, uh, uh, the excavation and documentation of an Anasazi site um, in the southwest United States. Um, first up, um, the excavation of the mound tomb. Um, Leah DeLong, uh, a scholar, uh, pointed out that there is visual precedent um, for a mural, including uh, the excavation of a mound tomb. Um, and it actually comes from a very, very unlikely source. Um, it, I'm showing you here the house of the Eli Lilly mansion outside of Indianapolis. Uh, this is Eli Lilly of the Eli Lilly pharmaceutical family. Um, he uh, was one of the few people who actually had tons of money in the 30s because like now, everyone needs drugs. And so he was making uh, uh, plenty of money. And he had this wonderful old uh, mansion, uh, which is mostly decorated like this. Um, very, very traditional. Um, but on the third floor in his ballroom, he commissioned an artist, um, John Poussy, to create a whole series of murals um, on the third floor. That house, by the way, is a 16,000 square foot house. It's not a tiny little place. Um, and so this ballroom was actually quite, quite large as well. Um, and uh, uh, Poussy was born in 1905 uh, and died in 1966. He was actually born in Council Bluffs. Um, studied at Northwestern and at Yale before traveling abroad where he studied in Paris, 
um, and in Spain uh, and traveled through North Africa before returning to Omaha in 1933. Um, he did a series of murals in the Chieftain Hotel in Council Bluffs um, and did some work um, in our own murals uh, in our own uh, uh, Epley Hotel here in Cedar Rapids. Um, he worked at ISU, he worked um, at the Des Moines Library, but he was hired in the 1930s by Eli Lilly um, to decorate this ballroom. Uh, and then uh, when World War II broke out, he enlisted um, and actually became a military man. Um, he served in World War II and the Korean War, rising to the rank of Lieutenant Colonel. Uh, and, uh, and so the scene, which is very small, it's, it's to the right-hand side of this overview, um, is here. And I give you two different versions of it. Anytime I made it any too big, it would get very, very fuzzy. Um, but you can see um, some gentlemen in front of a mound that's been cut away with some artifacts in front of them. I think, um, and I, I thank uh, uh, Professor DeLong for her um, uh, 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 note that there is a visual precedent um, prior to this mural um, for this type of scene. But I actually think that that wasn't uh, a visual uh, reference for him. I don't think that, that Jones really needed to um, see another mural or another mural image um, to be inspired by what he did. I think um, instead he just simply needed to be paying attention to the fact that there were all kinds of, uh, uh, of mound tombs being excavated at this time. Here's the comparison that I make. I think it's a very, very, it's a good comparison, but a very loose, a very loose comparison. For example, um, the Nolan Mounds um, in, in Indiana. And remember that Jones you know, was born in Indiana um, and was well familiar with Indiana. Eli Lilly is in Indiana. There's a lot of Indiana connections um, here. And so here's an example, um, the Nolan Mounds in southeastern Indiana um, that were, was excavated by Glenn Black in 1934-35, just prior to the beginning of this mural cycle. Uh, interestingly enough, Glenn Black's chief funder was Eli Lilly. Oh. Eli Lilly was uh, kind of an amateur uh, archaeologist. He was very interested in artifacts, especially artifacts in Indiana. Um, he funded Black um, in this project in 1936. Eli Lilly um, buys Angel Mound um, for $63,000, which was a fortune. Um, in, in 1936, um, and Black spent the next 25 years excavating Angel Mound. Uh, but I'm focusing on these Nolan Mounds uh, first and foremost because they predate our mural, um, and I think uh, there was a lot of excitement around um, the excavation of these mounds. These are simply mounds um, out, in the, uh, you know, out in the landscape. You can see um, in the right-hand image, this mound is near uh, a barn, um, which is interesting because our mound is near a barn as well. Uh, and uh, you can see from these two images, this is still the Nolan Mound, um, you can see how they excavate. They do slice straight down into the ground. And so the left-hand image, um, you actually are seeing the profile of the mound cut right down, straight down, so the mound abruptly ends. Uh, and then uh, in the right-hand image, you see um, how they, they uh, take soil away in blocks. Um, and it gives us that same sort of blocking form that we have with our mound. And a couple more images of the mound um, site. This is, again, all the Nolan Mound um, in Indiana. And typically, these were burial mounds, so you would encounter skeletal remains, um, as you see in in our mural um, here. The, the middle image, which is again still part of this inherited American culture, um, is, uh, shows an individual filming at Teotihuacan um, in, in Mexico. Uh, this is specifically the temple of the feathered serpent. Uh, and we know that because when you look at images, of the Temple of Feather Serpent in, in Teotihuacan, um, Jones is well aware of these forms, especially these kind of uh, serpent heads that pop out of the architecture. Um, and they are brightly colored, um, although less so now, but they were when they were discovered. 
And I think the, uh, while he may not be specifically referencing um, this individual, Manuel Gamio, um, uh, I think that uh, Gamio um, is a good surrogate for the filmmaker that you see here. Uh, Gamio uh, was born in 1883 and died in 1960. He really was the father of Mexican uh, anthropology and archaeology. Um, he was an anthropologist, he was an archaeologist, he was a sociologist, and he was also an occasional documentary filmmaker. He was the first scientific investiga investigator to explore uh, Teotihuacan, the first person to really, really research that site. Um, he was in the United States between the years 1925 and 1930, publishing books. Um, he was a published writer and a speaker, and I think um, uh, if, uh, if Jones isn't specifically referencing Gamio, he's referencing somebody like him. Um, he certainly was a known entity in um, the late 20s, um, and there was a fascination um, for the discovery and, and the research around, around these, particular, these particular ruins. And here, we might, I might need your help, Seth, in getting this video to run. Can you push it? This is a short, silent film. Um, and we're not going to get rid of the, the BlanchettAsianArt.com. Thank you. Um, that was filmed in the 1920s um, at, at Teotihuacan. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's an example of the fascination um, that um, people had. On one, there we go. There's no sound to it, but um, it gives you a great sort of sense of the fact that this was a destination. This was filmed. These kind of films would precede uh, precede um, uh, films in the movie theater. It would be one of those um, short films that would precede the major. Uh, uh, the major screening. Um, so this was your way of traveling to Mexico without leaving the comfortable seat of your movie theater. And I always, when I've seen this now several times, I'm always wondering how people dressed like that can be climbing up and down the, the pyramid, the Teotihuacan, um, especially that you know they're not wearing hiking shoes or boots that we would um, wear today, or this little this little group of, um, uh, of young ladies, this little team of young ladies who we see again later. Of course ladies wore skirts, of course. And here you can see that the feathered serpent heads. There was a fascination at this time with all things sort of ancient Mexican culture. I'm sure Jones would have been well aware of it. And let's play volleyball. <laughs> Perfect setting. <laughs> it was an active excavation even then. These people look less than inspired <laughs> about their work. I mean, who throws soil without even looking towards where you're throwing it. Yeah. <laughs> and so that's the end of that one. So. Um, but I think it's a, uh, you might have to advance me past that. Uh, I think it's a, a, a sort of a, an example of the fascination of the Mexican culture uh, and, uh, and, and, and the fact that people were sent down there to film it. Um, and that's what we're seeing um, in Jones's, uh, in this particular section of Jones's mural. The next section um, looks uh, at the Anasazi. Um, actually, the Anasazi is a, is a misnomer, like the WPA is. Um, it simply means sort of the ancient ones. That Really, what we're talking about when we talk about the Anasazi is we're talking about the ancestral Puebloans. Uh, and, uh, and they are well known in the uh, areas of Colorado, Utah, New Mexico, and Arizona. Um, and they are perhaps best known for um, structures such as the Cliff Palace, what we call the Cliff Palace today, uh, at Mesa Verde um, in Colorado near Durango, in southwest Colorado. And here's another view of it. Um, and, and I think, and I pulled that particular image up because what we do see is we see a structure huddled up against a cliff. 
Um, and I think that there is a, uh, I think there's a specific reference um, to the Southwest in this section of Jones's mural um, and, and to uh, locations like, um, like Mesa Verde. Um, and, and he shows someone, a kind of Indiana Jones type of figure, um, who's carefully measuring everything. He's got all of these artifacts that he's found laid out in front of him in this wonderful semicircle. Um, and he's got calipers out and he's measuring very carefully this particular pot uh, that you see sort of as the, as the focus of it. And uh, it's a beautiful pot um, with spirals on the side of it um, that you see sort of in detail here. And the Anasazi were known for making pots with spirals. Um, so he's, he is uh, being somewhat uh, accurate in his representation, Jones, Jones is, of, of doing this. Um, but, uh, but they're not, not quite exactly the same uh, sort of pot, a lot of whiteware with black um, decoration. But a pot like the one that he shows um, does exist, but it's not from the Southwest. It's actually from Angel Mound in Indiana, um, the other uh, the other mound um, uh, that was being uh, that would be excavated. The trouble is the timing, the timing here. Glenn Black does not excavate Angel Mound until later, um, and so either he's excavating this pot at exactly the same moment that Jones is getting to this point in his mural, um, or or this particular uh, source image that I have. It's not exactly the same pot, um, but it's darn close. Um, it's redware. It has the swirl. It has this wonderful kind of stepped pyramid form. But while the pot I show you has two pyramids, one uh, 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 pointing up and one pointing down, the, one, the pot in the, in the mural itself has just the one. I think I have, yeah, a little comparison there for you. Um, uh, or the image that I found is misidentified. Uh, that's a possibility, too. Uh, I found this image while looking for uh, something else. Uh, I wasn't actually researching Angel Mound at all. Um, but uh, this was a shot by somebody uh, who visited Angel Mound, and they've identified it as Angel Mound. But it could also have possibly come um, uh, from the Nolan Mound. Um, but unless I'm right there and looking at the label myself, I don't know. Um, so it's possible, um, because Black worked on both of those. Um, excavations that, that maybe the information that is attached to this image uh, is incorrect. But I think it's a much better match for what Jones is doing um, in, in his mural. But he is being accurate. He's just taking the wrong Native American group um, and putting them in the wrong place uh, in this particular case. I have not found anything from the Southwest that looks uh, specifically like this. The closest analogy is the, uh, the uh, Native Americans uh, civilizations found in Indiana, which are all part of that larger, broader Mississippian um, uh, region. Uh, here at, the, at his foot, you see what it looks like an axe head, and it is a um, fairly typical kind of axe head. This is an Anasazi axe head, um, and, but they are pretty generic in form anyway. Uh, many, many Native American groups um, had axe heads like this. Um, and then these wonderful petroglyphs behind uh, um, the, uh, the uh, archaeologist. Uh, and those are very, very typical, actually, of the Anasazi. Um, you can find, these are petroglyphs actually from Utah, um, but they are they're also Puebloan. Um, and um, <clears throat> and there's, just, there's just lots and lots and lots of these. There's no exact match for the ones that are in the mural, but um, uh, but it sort of gives you a nice sort of overview uh, or general view of the kind of petroglyphs that were associated with um, the Native American people, specifically the Pueblo um, in, in the Southwest US. And then we come to this last section. Um, this is called Material Progression in the book, uh, Art in Federal Buildings. Um, and we see in one section um, corn, potatoes, and beans. Um, and it is true that those are all actually indigenous um, plants. Um, corn um, was cultivated in Mexico at least 10,000 years ago. Uh, potatoes um, have been uh, kind of developed in many different parts of the world um, uh, simultaneously. But the oldest information that we have 
um, comes from Peru and Bolivia, um, so the Americas. Um, and then beings of this type of beings, the kind of climbing beings, actually come from Mesoamerica as well. And it is certainly part of our inherited culture, um, these, these plant forms. Uh, but they just kind of hang out there in these weird little triangles um, on the side. And then above that um, is this image of newspaper production, um, which is sort of odd, sort of the odd thing out. Uh, and, and one uh, wonders if that actually 